Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're gonna talk about the point of no return. Specifically, we're gonna talk a little bit about back testing and splitting your data for model development, and then doing that back testing and figure out uh, what's going on here. Um, I'm gonna talk about this more from a quant perspective, not an investing buy side perspective, but you can draw a little parallels here if you're interested in technically back testing, as they call it. Um, but today we're gonna talk about um, out of sample versus out of time, and why we only do out of time in finance for the most part. And then two, we're going to talk about uh, the point of no return and why uh, this creates information leakage. Okay, so first off here, let's just think about finance as a whole. What is the driving force of finance? What is the one thing that is always changing, that is always you know breaking models here? And this is going to be time, right? Finance is very unique in the fact that it's time related. This isn't biology where you can like randomly sample, you know, I don't know, a bunch of monkeys or something and you end up with the same sort of thing over and over and you can just keep sampling um, to get that here. Um, out of sample just means you have some sort of population. Um, so let's call this population. Uh, and then we're going to sample randomly. We're going to call it A. And this random sample we're going to take, uh, which can be our data set here. And for out of sample, uh, we typically have dev. So let me put a little asterisk here. Uh, statistics. Um, typically only requires what we call dev. This is the data we developed the model on. Uh, and also we have out of, and we're gonna call it time here for a second. So it's out of sample, out of time, whatever. Um, this is what you do your testing. So this is what you test the model on. This is what you train the model on. Now for machine learning, um, we're going to have training. We call it training instead of dev. Um, we're also going to have val. This is how we calibrate our coefficients or our estimates or our structure of the model. And then we're gonna have testing, which is the endpoint, which will be considered out of time as we'll talk about here in a second. Um, this is just terminology. So I'm gonna try to use, I'll use them maybe a little bit interchangeably, but just know dev is the same as training, um, out of time is the same as testing. Val is something fairly unique to machine learning required. Um, we actually can, and I have done it before, use val uh, inside of statistics as well for some of this sort of testing and dynamics here. Anyways, so when we have our dev data, so the development data that we're going to use uh, for out of sample, it just means we're going to randomly sample now, which is what we got from A. And out of that randomly sample, I'm just going to randomly split this um, such that you have some sort of percentage. So we could say 70, 30, which just means 70% of the data randomly sampled. It's gonna be for development. Um, and then we're going to do our out of time testing, or in this case, are out of sample testing uh, with 30% of the data here. Now, again, in machine learning terms, you might have 70, 10, 20. This just means um, training, um, val, uh, and testing, which is gonna be considered out of sample here. But see what happens, you just randomly sample a bunch of data. That's fine, that's how the world works. We get sample A, and then we just randomly split it into 70, 30 mix, and we do some sort of modeling on here. Now, this isn't valid um, for almost every financial application, and the reason is because that's not how the model is going to be used. We're not going to randomly sample from data across, you know, in the real world. Uh, and finance data comes in in time. So it's why we have a serial correlation, and all this means is serial correlation means that if you look at something like a stock price, for example, um, say this is time T, uh, time T is highly correlated with, you know, T plus one or T minus one um, because the data points are related to each other. That information is being passed from time point to time point to time point. It is something fairly unique to finance, right? We are all humans. This is what we're modeling. Humans are going to look at yesterday, the day before and figure out like, okay, uh, the value was say $10 for this stock. Uh, the next day should be around $10. Now, if you didn't have serial correlation, some sort of problem here, and it just like, you know, randomly jumps around. So if this was a stock price and you said, okay, today is going to be, I don't know, say this is time T, uh, say this is $10 today, um, tomorrow, then it should be something close to that, but it's not. All of a sudden it jumps up here, let's say to like T plus one is like, I don't know, $20. And then the next day it's randomly down, I don't know, it's like $1 at T plus two. Um, you Finance has serial correlation. That's just how the world works. It's a feature uh, built into the world, built into our data here. So we need to incorporate that. Um, this is why you can't randomly sample. Um, if you split your data now and you randomly sample, you know, points through here, and then 
you, you know, have random samples of these. What you're going to be doing is your out of sample population of this 70%. It's going to have every um, time period in it. And so when we go to use it in practice, it's not going to be useful because you're going to overfit it because basically if you're missing a few points here that were the development and you have a few points here that were the, the out of sample, um, you kind of know the other points around it. And so by doing that in a modeling, uh, you're kind of cheating because you already kind of know what the value is going to be just looking around it because you have serial correlation up here. So you can't use out a sample. It's not valid uh, in practice, right? Even if you built this model here and you randomly sampled it, uh, you would have no idea which direction this this variable stock prices, GDP, CPI is going to go because you randomly sample and overfit across everything in time and you pretended like time was independent and it is not. Time works chronologically, that's how finance works. So to get around this, what you have to do uh, is we need to split this at a time split and say this is gonna be our 70%, this is gonna be our 30%, but it is now considered out of time um, because we split solely on time. So maybe this is like 20, 23, and this is like, I don't know, 2020 to 2022. Um, but you would have to split based on time. So this is why out of time has to be used in finance. That's how it works. That's how we're going to use the model, right? As time progresses, we're going to do a prediction here. Um, we don't want to randomly sample because um, you will get very, very overfit models, and then they actually will blow up because the model is not designed properly because your data splitting here between... Um, you know, dev, val, out of time, or machine learning terms, training, val, and testing is just not a valid approach. Okay, now the reason we have uh, the point of no return, as I'm going to call it, is that what we're going to have is we're going to have our dev, we're going to have our val. So let me, let me just do this machine learning terms so you get a little bit clearer understanding. So we're going to have our training. Uh, we're going to have our val data. And we're going to have our out of time data here, which is going to also be called our testing data. So let's say this is, I don't know, 2018 through 2020. This is 2021. And this is 2022 through 2023. Now for machine learning and even for statistics, you can use this val piece. And what we're going to do is we're going to build some sort of model. So I'm just gonna say, you know, um, model one is equal to, I don't know, some sort of structure alpha plus beta one x one plus beta two x two um, plus epsilon some error we have we just built this model on the training set and then we're going to say okay we want to see like machine learning terms um, how do we calibrate again the the estimates or the coefficients um, how do we do this structure so this is the same for machine learning and stats right uh, in machine learning terms right say you have a decision tree um, you know, how many leaves or how many splits should you have? Um, you know, how many observations uh, should be in each leaf? Uh, these sort of de decisions determine the structure of the model. Um, if you think in statistical terms, if you want to talk about this, uh, imagine you have an ARIMA model. This is time series based, you know. Um, how, how many lags should you use? Uh, you know, again, how many variables should you use? How many, so we'll do variables here. Okay, so how many lags, how many variables? Uh, AR versus MA, you know, one, both. How do you structure that? That's changing the structure and the design of the equation. Um, and so this equation might iterate um, to be, you know, something else, like maybe we call it M2. It might be alpha plus beta seven, X seven plus beta, I don't know, three, X three plus epsilon. Just meaning, right, we maybe changed um, X7 and X3, whatever variables these are, for one and two, we swap some variables out. Um, maybe we then do another iteration and we say, you know, alpha equals, I don't know, beta seven, X7 plus, I don't know, let's say beta three, X3 um, plus, you know, beta one, X1 plus our epsilon term. In this case, right, we're adding an extra variable maybe, so we're changing that structure around, we're testing, we're looking at things. This iterative process needs to go from training to validation, and then validation feeds uh, information back into training, and you go around and around and around. 
this is okay. This is a fine process to do. This helps you look at the models, compare the statistics. Maybe you're comparing residuals, for example, like, I don't know, maybe you have root mean squared error. And, you know, you look at your, your dev, so training, uh, your val, and you're going back and forth and you have some metric here, you know, 0 0.08, 0 0.09. Uh, and this is model one, you have model two, maybe you have, you know, more metrics between all these. And what you're trying to do here uh, is you're trying to look at, you know, how do I select the best model? How do I select the best structure? Do I have serial correlation issues in the residuals? How do I get rid of these, right? You're struggling and working through the whole model development process. So this piece here is the model development process here. Now, the point of no return is the fact that we never, ever, ever use out of time um, to make a decision to change anything about the model, the data, the structure, the transformations, nothing. Once you pass this point, right? So everything should be done in this point here. So the development process, including the training and the validation, the structuring, the training, the fitting, all that stuff, this is called model development. This is where you do all of the development. So if you wanna build 100 models or 1,000 models or three models or whatever, this is where you do this, okay? And then once you hit the point of no return, now you're going to take your out of time data and you're going to make decisions based on this. So maybe you have room mean squared error, maybe you have dev and val, and you have some sort of number here. And now you're gonna add your out of time number and you might have model one and you might have, you know, a bunch of these tables all the way out to n and you might have, you know, dev, val, out of time. And you can use all kinds of other metrics and analysis and all this. But at this point, now that you're adding in uh, your out of time pieces, you want to look at these and make the decision. You cannot go back. If you go back, you're basically lying and cheating in the world of quant. Um, now, academic papers do this all the time. This is why it invalidates the research. Uh, investing firms do this. Model development at banks do this. Everybody gets stuck in this. A lot of times they go, oh, I just... You know, let's let's give an example here. Let me show you. Um, let's say, um, so I look at two things. One is going to be um, the raw number, right? So is your root mean squared error good enough, right? So, you know, maybe we look at this one and it's like 0 0.08 and this is 0 0.09 and this is 0 0.10. Um, right, you might look at this and say, okay, 8% error, 9% error, 10% error, like, Raw number, 10% error, this is good enough. But maybe you have another model that has like a 0 0.03, 0 0.03, 0 0.01. So 1% error, 3% error, 3% error, like, oh, this one's absolute value is amazing, right? So you could use this out of time information to select a model that you've already developed. You're not changing structures, design, and all that. You can make that. That's based off the raw number, right? Number 3% error is better than 10% error. Now, the other thing I'm going to tell you guys is going to be looking at um, the difference in numbers. So you might also have a case where you have model, I'm going to call it model model X, just for kicks here. Uh, and you have your dev is going to be, you know, 0 0.0001. Uh, you're going to have val, let's say is 0 0.003. And then you're going to have out of time is going to be 0 0.82. Now, from an absolute raw number standpoint, right, you wouldn't select this because this error is, is too large. Um, but maybe it's really small. Um, but what we're looking at is the difference between these from 0001 to 82 is too freaking large. The model blew up. It does not work. All right, so I've seen another example. Let's do this as well. Let's say it's 0 0.001, 0 0.003, and then it's, you know, 0. Point, I don't know, 0, maybe... Yeah, zero nine. Um, so this model's performance and out of time falls between this one and this one. Um, but because it went from, you know, these two are like near zero. And all of a sudden it shifted this huge jump to like 9%. So it went from less than a percent, less than a percent to 9%. It, it's not going to work. It might be the best model or the raw number here, um, but the difference shift is too large. And what this is telling us financially is as time's passing, we overfit uh, between training and VAL or development and VAL. And then it blew up and out of time. And so when we go to use that, if this passage of time here, say is like one year or two years, in one to two years, I would expect this difference here 
um, being, you know, like a 9% shock to be 9% worse here. It's just not going to work. So these are things to consider here, but this is always considered the point of no return because if you start taking information, like you're like, well, you know, this model I like better than the other models, but it doesn't have as good as an error as this, you know, 3% over here. Maybe if I take, you know, some of the variables from this model and I plug them into this model and maybe I change the structure and I make some sort of adjustment. Um, now what happens is you're actually having so information leakage. And this is never gonna be how the model's used in time, right? You're never gonna see six months into the future and go, well, if I add this one variable in, then it will be better. Yeah, it, it will be better because you literally took information from the future and you cheated and you took that information and put it into your model in the past and then you're bragging about how good your model is. Um, Again, if this is accidental, I've seen this happen accidentally. Once you start screwing with out of time, it ruins the entire project because now you as a person have too much information. Um, your data is stored and all that. You have insight on how to adjust and basically fix the models so that they can predict the future because you already looked at the future, looked at the answer, and then built the model to fit the future here. So I hope you guys understand, right? You're cheating by doing that and it's not going to work well in practice. So the way to prevent that is to do all of your development, all of your validation of all that on the training of set or the development data here. Do all that work first, build all the models you want, and then realize as soon as you're, say you're done, you cannot go back. There's no undoing this, right? This is Pandora's box. As soon as you peek and look at your out of time data, uh, you can't do it. You invalidate the entire project here. So make sure you spend as much time as possible really understanding and building the models in this state. And when you pull the trigger and you go over here to the other side of the fence, to the out of time, it is the point of no return. You cannot undo Pandora's box. Um, you now know information that you would never know. Um, and so it invalidates kind of your process here. So I hope you guys learn this. I hope you understand this a little bit better. You have to use out of time in finance. Um, once you finish your model development and you go to out of time, you cannot use that information uh, to adjust and change models because that invalidates the entire scientific process here. So anyways, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. If you found it helpful, please do subscribe. It helps this channel out a lot. And as always, until next time.